welcome to the Moving Forward Talk Show. I'm your host, Jennifer Collins, along with my friends, Christy and Emily. Today, we'll be speaking with Charity Rissler Watrich, who's an author. She was also raised in the same high control group all three of us came from. Before we get started with Charity, I would like to talk about a question that we have from a listener. This listener was never part of the movement that we were a part of, the Brandon movement, um, but she had a boyfriend who was, and she sent us a question about blaspheming the Holy Spirit and the fear that goes around that teaching. And we want to talk a little bit about that kind of fear at the end of our show. So if you want to hear the answer to that listener's question, stick around, and that'll be coming up at the end of the show. So I'm interested to see how Charity continues our discussion, demonstrating that life goes on and healing happens as long as you keep moving forward. Without any further ado, Charity, I would like to let you introduce yourself, first of all. Hi, y'all. It's a pleasure to be on the show. I'm honored to be one of the first uh, guests. Um, so, uh, as you said, my name's Charity, Charity Watrich, formerly Charity Rissler. Um, and I grew up in the message from zero to a about 16, um, depending on what you count actually leaving. <laughs> I stopped believing in it when I was 16. Um, so yeah, and I've been out of it for, um, like coming, oh, uh, yeah, about 10 years, 10 years now. <laughs> so as you're talking about leaving the message, would you like to tell us some details about how and why that happened? I was very, devout, a very devout message believer, I would say. Um, I was very proud of being a part of the message, um, which I know isn't always the case for everybody, but I think because I was homeschooled and I was, I was very isolated. Most of my friends were from the message. So because of that, I, they were, they were accepting me. I didn't have that same peer pressure that maybe other people did. Um, but I was, yeah, I was very proud of being a part of the message. Um, and I, I started, um, there were some things over the years that didn't sit right, but we were taught a, a blind faith. And there are some things that just, got pushed down. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I didn't really start to question it until, um, one of my brothers, I didn't know this, but he was doing research about, um, about Brandomism, about the message. And he said something to me. It was like, how everyone thinks that what they believe is correct. How do you know? Like, how do we know that what we believe is correct? And it just, I was like, I don't, that question made me uncomfortable because I hadn't critically examined my belief system ever. Um, and so as a teenager, that definitely made me feel uncomfortable. Um, and we also weren't really allowed to doubt that was considered a, a big sin or like ask questions like that. And so even asking that internally would be considered a sin, at least in the sect that I grew up in. And so um, after, so after that, I um, overheard a bit of a conversation that I don't think I was, that I wasn't supposed to overhear. My brother was talking to my mom and he was voicing some doubts and it was, I, I walked in and um, it was one of those things where you just knew like you were in the wrong place because they stopped talking. And I was like, what's going on here? Um, and in that conversation, he told me that, that Branham, he didn't believe that Branham was a prophet. And that... <sighs> I honestly believe that God was prepping my heart to hear that with um, some prayers that I'd been praying leading up to that, which I can share that too, but I go into more detail in my book. I don't want to, uh, I don't know how long you want me to answer these questions, um, but 
Uh, that's when I actually started doing some research and critically thinking about um, what was going on and what was being taught and did I believe it. And yeah, that's when everything flipped that evening. Well, I think you answered that question um, very thoroughly um, without giving away too much from your book, which I really enjoyed reading recently, Charity. Thank you for um, writing that and having it out there for people who can benefit from those who've gone before, if you will. Um, so would you like to give us a little update about where you are now in life? I would love to. Um, so right now, I so I grew up in Pennsylvania. I'm now um, all the way over in sunny Texas. Um, I am married to a wonderful Christian man who... Um, who I wouldn't have been able to marry for multiple reasons if I was in the message. Um, and I have a beautiful daughter and um, who's a toddler now, and I have another daughter on the way. Um, so, yeah, I'm very excited about that. I guess other things going on in my life. I'm a writer. Right now I'm mostly doing full-time mom things, but I love writing and I'm very involved with writers' communities at my church. Um, I am a believer uh, in Jesus after after going through, after growing up in the message. It didn't happen right away, but I am currently um, a believer in Jesus and the Bible. And yeah, that's where I am now. I, When I read your book, the one big thing that I took away from it was just the way you tried to be so fair to everyone that that you um that you mentioned in your book about their hearts um you can just sense that and in, in everything that you're saying in your book even for people that that uh you had conflict with you were always so fair with them and i would i would love to hear you speak a little bit about how you went about that process of writing and deconstructing what you had gone through as a child in in a high control group how did you come to this place of like so much maturity <laughs> so early on in your journey out um, to, to forgive and to just recognize the humanity and all these people that you had in your history? That's a great question. I think really I have felt, I have felt the grace of God and just that I, I think I could easily still be in the message if my eyes weren't opened. And so, and I also feel like I, before I became a regenerate believer and actually started believing in God post coming out of the message, I think I was kind of mean. <laughs> and so I want to have grace for other people who are stuck in a mindset and have been brainwashed either their whole life or for a season and they're hurting and um, they, you know, I feel like they don't know what they're saying and they don't, um, they don't always, you know, we're, yeah, I, I guess that's how I would answer it. It's just that I think I was in a similar place. And so I want to give grace to people who, have hurt me through the process and a and after because I might have treated me similarly, <laughs> if I'm being honest. That's amazing. I, I just think that's so great that you were able to get there um, in, you know, writing your book because I, I, you, the timeline, wh wh at what point did you write that book when you had left? It was fairly early on in your journey. Yeah, it was fairly early on. Um, I'm trying to remember... It would have been 2019 that I wrote it, and um, I would have been out of my parents' house about two years, and out of the out of believing the message for um, I don't know math isn't mathing today of uh, four or five years <laughs> four or five years so not a lot um, I. I think it helped just that I I approached it 
soberly. I read a book on how to write a memoir and I spent some time in prayer like Every day before I would start writing, I would spend some time in prayer, um, just to anchor myself and because it was, it was pretty emotional writing and I didn't want my motivation for writing to be to get back at anybody or, um, I didn't want it just to be like cathartic. I wanted it to be helpful to people, um, and I couldn't do that from a place of bitterness or anger. It wouldn't have been helpful if I did. I find it fascinating hearing you writing a memoir so early out of the message. And uh, here I am sitting, what, 20 years out. And I've had people, you should write a book. But it's terrifying because people you know can be reading it. And yet here I am. uh, People I know can be watching this podcast, too. So I guess even though I've done bold things in my life, uh, the, the memoir thing is still... That's still one of those things. How So how did your family handle you writing a memoir, which included them? <laughs> I tried to go about it as smartly as I could um, while holding my firm, my boundaries. Like, And for me, that looked like I wrote the whole first draft without telling them that I was writing it. Um, because I felt like I wouldn't be able to write it if they knew that I was writing it. Um, and they were, I was still, um, still in, I still had some contact with some of those uh, more toxic family members at the time. So I didn't want them to know about it. I knew I wasn't going to be able to write it. I finished the first draft and that's when I told them that I was, I wrote this book and I was going to publish it. And I let them see the first draft before before anybody else. And I said, like, if you have issues with, like, my memory, like, you think I, I said something wrong, like, if you have issues with anything in this book, like, here's your deadline to tell me <laughs> that you have issues. And I may or may not change something, but this is, this is my chance to let you voice your concerns. And so I just opened up a little window. <laughs> and um, at the end of the window, I was like, it's closed. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, because I, I didn't, I wanted to be very clear that this was something that I was doing. Um, and then t- as far as their reactions go, um, I have... I had 12 siblings and so, and eight, eight, I have older, eight older siblings. So there was a lot, there were a lot of opinions. Um, there was some little uh, manipulation and blackmail type things. Um, social, like a lot of tactics that would be used in like a high control group, like the message my family was using to try to control me um when i say my family like some family members some family members were very supportive others who had left the message um so it was it was a mixed bag (laughs) but it was very hard i think if i hadn't had um a group of good friends around me who were supporting me um and i didn't feel conviction that it was the right thing I wouldn't have been able to finish it because of the pressure that they put on me. That's good. I was that when you were talking, I was wondering if you had a supportive group around you while you were doing that cuz that's a that's quite an undertaking and then opening it up for discussion. <laughs> that's very brave of you. So, like was it was there a lot of angry feedback. You said, you know, there was support from those siblings who had left already, but uh I guess, how how ugly did it get from the other side? Or did they just go, oh, it's just she's doing what she's doing. This is terrible. I'm not even going to bother. And they missed the deadline. No, um, I was getting calls all the time. Um, and one family member in particular, her and her husband wrote me a letter, which basically said 
why they thought Branham was a prophet. And at the end of it, they said that, and um, why they thought what I was doing was wrong. And at the end of it, they said, we want to just send this letter to you, but if you choose to publish the book, then we're going to send it to whoever we see fit. And also, we are not going to associate with anybody who has supported you in publishing it. Um, and not, like, be, not be at family gatherings and stuff. So, that sent me into a panic attack because even though I wasn't the one who was, like, stating that boundary, um, you could call it a boundary, but it was, it was, toxic it wasn't a good boundary um because i was thinking okay now like am i the one like driving the family apart because we're not going to be able to set aside our differences because this person and her husband is not going to show up at family gatherings because i'm there um and because other people like didn't protest my book and so now like it's going to be my fault that they don't show up and then that heat's going to be on me and so that manipulation really stressed me out. Um, but I had already decided that I was going to publish it. And um, I totally called their bluff on it. I thought they were serious. But <laughs> um, after they still showed up to stuff and just kind of pretended like it didn't, like they didn't say those things. Um, yeah, really messed up. But <laughs> my parents also my dad was still believing at the time and my mother was not believing but i think she was still pretty sympathetic to a lot of it and she was calling me regularly um saying that i shouldn't be doing it um and so it was there was that and then as soon as i announced it there was a lot of like old friends sending me letters and emails like after everything that we've done for your family and for you how could you do this like um how could you betray us like this people saying that i was you know like um doing the devil's work and um accursed and all of the, all of that people who used to be like fa old family friends uh, stuff like that so i didn't like it well, that's why it's called a high control group, right? They try and control you even after you leave. <laughs> so um, I do want to go ahead and let you have a chance to tell us about both of your books. Um, the first book, I read the whole entire thing pretty quickly. It was a, an easy read, an engaging read. Um, and that one's called Where the Willow Weeps. Is that correct? That is correct. Let me read a quote from it, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's okay. So um, that night, the spell was broken and I started to see telling me that I could make a life for myself outside of the message would have been like telling a fish to join you in the fresh air. I knew there was a life outside, but that wasn't possible for me. And if it was possible, I had no idea what my future might look like. And I think that probably encapsulates what I took away from that first book pretty well. I wrote that book because I felt and I wrote it so early on, even though it's like I it's a memoir and I'm <laughs> I'm <laughs> I was like barely an adult. <laughs> I still feel like I'm barely an adult. Um, but I wrote it because I knew that I had a window of time where, um, if I wrote that, people from my life would read it. Um, who I'd known recently, like the past few years, like they would probably read it. Um, but the book is basically about my childhood in the message leading up to how I figured out it was cold, leaving it, um, subsequent, like, lifestyle changes, and then also wrestling with, um, with figuring out the world and coming up with trying to figure out what I believed. Um, so I was mad at God for, for a while and not trusting God after being in a high control group like that. Um, that was using God's name to control. <laughs> I didn't really trust God. And so I share, um, I share when I became a believer and over the next like year, um, really I was only a believer for a year. Um, when I wrote the book, 
Um, but I share leading up to that point and how my life has been changed in a positive way, even just in that short amount of time um, from from leaving the message and finding God outside of it. I have one more quote, um, and it talks about almost exactly what you were heading toward right now. It says, um, it's talking about moving into Christianity and how different that was from the group, you group where you grew up. It says, a pastor should encourage his congregation to question his words and to wrestle with the scripture themselves. Christianity is about person, personal relationships with Christ. Being a part of a church helps you with that, but it is by no means a substitute for individual study. And um, I found that as another striking quote. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think just believing everything you're told, um, taking it at face at face value, um, especially it's it's hard to live um, a genuine, authentic life when you're believing you're saying you believe scripture, and you're also saying you be- believe this pastor or this prophet 100%, and those two things contradict each other, (laughs) that is really hard. And it's hard to have a relationship with God if it's always like filtered through another person instead of just your personal relationship with God in scripture and in prayer. I think any faith, um, to be a genuine faith, has to be a personal faith. And um, I think any um, any person in the Christian church, if they're following what Jesus said about being a leader, they are a servant and um, they're definitely open to being questioned. And um, the Bible talks about iron sharpening iron. And so um, if I'm a leader, then I should be looking for people to help me refine myself, refine my faith. And uh, so, yeah, I appreciate what you had to say about that. So let's go ahead and move into the idea of healthy boundaries. And maybe we can come up with between the four of us sort of um, a working definition for healthy boundaries. (laughs) Mine has been a work in progress since um, since leaving. A lot of times in a high control group, we are not taught or told or even allowed really to set healthy boundaries with other people. Um, We are expected to be long suffering and gentle and agreeable in all things. Um, healthy boundaries is basically saying that there is a line in the sand. Um, and that line in the sand is around my person. It's around my family. It's around my happiness and my, um, my sense of self. And no one is going to cross that. Um, healthy boundaries are, um, things that we determine for our own selves and we set in our own lives and they're non-negotiables. They're things that, um, they're things like physical safety is a healthy boundary that we set for ourselves. No one can harm our person. Um, but they're also intangible emotion things, things like, like no one can speak to me in a way that's disrespectful or hurts me. Um, no one can, uh, you know, treat my family and my children in a way that I find reprehensible in a way that harms us as a family and as a group. Um, so to me, that would be a good definition of healthy boundaries, things I set for other people. Um, and it's non-negotiable. Yeah. I think I'd like to interject right there and say that, um, this comes up a lot in work with families who are dealing with mental health issues and, um, one thing we learned very quickly is we can't control what other people do. What, what we can control is our response to what other people do. And we can choose the company that we keep. We can choose how we will spend our resources. We will choose, can choose how we will spend our time. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, I guess, an addendum to what you said, Christy. When you set healthy boundaries, it's hard for those around you because they're so used to the dysfunctional system that it kind of throws them into a a tailspin and they are not getting the reply that they expect out of you. And when they try to force something or manipulate something like charity with, if you do this, we're going to write this letter and we're going to send it to everybody, you know, and normally be like, oh no, don't do that. Uh, But you're like, okay, I'm still doing this. So then they don't know what to do with that. 
that because you have stepped out of the toxic cycle and system. And sometimes it can actually get more ugly for a while because they're thrown into disarray. They're their little codependent person has stepped out of the cycle and that security that they had within for themselves, because a lot of times people are this way because of insecurities and they have to create this control around them. So when they lose that, they don't know what to do with it, you know? So that's, yeah, that's my kind of thought as I'm listening here. I would add one other thing to the boundaries is, When you set a boundary, you're setting a consequence to the boundary. And in order for the boundary to work, you need to respect yourself enough to hold it firm. If you say you're going to do something or you're not going to do something or you're going to limit your interaction with that person after they do something, like you got to actually follow through for it to work. Very true. Um, And then we talked about maybe managing boundaries when leaving. So if you were going to speak to someone who was leaving, um, like I know, I know of, of a couple who wanted to leave um, and they weren't sure when would be the right time to broach the topic with their family. When you leave a high control group, um, there are tons of ways you can go about doing it, right? There's people that, that leave kind of quietly and let their lives speak for themselves. And that's perfectly fine. And then there's people who leave and seem to burn the bridges behind them. That is also okay. Because um, sometimes in order to leave something toxic, you have to you have to break the binds that tie you to it. Um, I would say when you first leave, one of the most important things that you should do is you need to have that moment like, uh, I is it a uh, Gandalf that says you should come no farther and you should like make the stand and say like, this is as far as it's going to go. Um, this is my line. Um, I didn't do that. <laughs> I, I let a lot of toxic take place um, at my expense. When I first left, um, I really, my hope for people that leave, if they, if you're watching this and you're just leaving and your family is being ugly, I would say um, set a line and stick to your line. So maybe it's, it's, we can have this conversation. We can have this conversation via email. That would be a great line to make so that it doesn't interrupt family interactions with grandparents and it doesn't become the topic of conversation at a dinner table and it's confined to its selected space. That's a way to do it. Another boundary is saying with that, with a particular person, I can't have this conversation with you. And that is an appropriate boundary to set. Um, and if they won't honor that, have the consequence be, you know, we can't sit down and have a meal together. If this is going to come up every time we sit down at the table. Um, so I would say establishing those boundaries early because it becomes incredibly difficult if you've allowed them to be trampled for a while. Um, to to then backtrack and say, nope, this is where we're going to go and we're not going to go any further. Then you're going to get some testing, some pushback. Um, but the sooner you can make those boundaries established, the better. I think um, I didn't really have the opportunity to enforce those boundaries properly um, right when I first left because I was still living with my parents and I was under 18. So I was limited at that time. I would encourage like any anyone, regardless of their age and situation, that um, as they start to like enforce those boundaries, that you also find other people <laughs> because it's really hard to be um, like you don't want to totally isolate yourself, which is going to happen if the only people you know are the people who are are pushing your buttons and you enforce those boundaries, then you're totally alone. You want to have other people in your life, and I think that will really that will really help you in enforcing boundaries. Is is to have other people. You know, I too lived with my parents for a long time after, so it was very very challenging. And I think at that point, the resources that are available now were not available, so it was all I knew. 
I didn't know I was in as much of a toxic system. Um, I knew our high demand group. I was told, uh, well, we're not as bad as other groups because we don't all live in a compound or, you know, uh, one pastor isn't ruler of all. Forget about the, the, the prophet, but, uh, that was the reasoning I was given why high, de- our high demand group wasn't actually the C word, um, you know, and so cult, uh, <laughs> but it was, it was hard. So I had a lot of toxic stuff to work through and I didn't even know it. So I think now charity, your book and the focus on mental health, which we'll talk about in an episode later, focusing uh, particularly on mental health and what that all looks like. There is a lot of stuff so we don't even know so i know i left i burned bridges in my wake um i was going to be the savior of all let everybody know all this terrible lies that i learned and everybody was going to follow me out because how could they not see it (laughs) so that was very hard so i actually moving overseas hit burnout and then only then was i diagnosed with my complex post-traumatic stress disorder And only then did I start to actually heal myself. So I think, you know, in talking about setting boundaries, you need to focus on getting healthy yourself and knowing what is healthy and who are you, especially us as women within these groups. We're a nobody. We don't have a voice. We, you know, uh, reading comments here we are talking. Uh, that's a big no-no that we're out, quote-unquote, teaching. <laughs> Even though if you look at the Bible, we have prophetesses and all of these others, uh, through, you know, uh, priests and, you know, everybody, through or priestesses, everybody throughout the Bible, there's a lot of women leaders. Um, but you don't see that when you're in these groups. You're to be seen and to not be heard. And that's not just for the children. That's for the wives in the kitchen as well. So I think, yeah, leaving... <sighs> Find support and realize that you're probably more mentally screwed up than you realize. As hard as that is, that's a super hard pill to swallow. But if I had like one regret, it was that I didn't come to the realization of how messed up I was earlier. We all carry baggage, um, whether we've been part of a high control group or a cult or if even just um, if we've been living with a family member who's toxic. Um, we all have things that we need to work on. And I think, I think therapy is a great thing and I haven't had it yet, <laughs> but I, I think that's in my near future. It's just something, the writing, I see the writing on the wall that that's, that's something that's going to be in my future. But, um, also I know, um, Charity, that your second book, um, addresses a little bit about, about that. And um, that's because your second book is called When the Lies Are the Loudest. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about that book and a little bit about mental health? So I wrote um, When the Lies Are Loudest because I personally have struggled with anxiety. I have uh, been clinically diagnosed at one time or another with anxiety, severe depressive disorder, and as well as PTSD. And so um, this was uh, I, this was a time when I actually found scripture to be healing. Unlike, uh, right when I was leaving the message, that was, I wouldn't have thought that I would ever think that about the scripture. Um, but, um, through some therapy and th- recommendation of my a Christian therapist, actually, um, and so through some therapy, I was able to uh, realize like, oh, this is, the Bible can actually be a tool here. And I didn't think that the Bible had anything to say about mental health um, because of being raised in the message. We, it was such a taboo um, topic. And Branham even says some things like, if you're depressed, you're not going to heaven. Like just some whack things that are not in the Bible about mental health. Um and so it was really refreshing for me to see some of these things about anxiety in the Bible. And so I wanted to share that with other people because it helped me so much. I don't by any means say that you should just 
read scripture to like uh to read and pray your anxiety away or your mental health away um you need uh there are god has given us a variety of tools <laughs> you know um we ca- ha- we have wise counsel in the form of licensed therapists um as well as good trusted friends and you know i believe that medication is a common grace um that's an awesome way that science has progressed that you can get a little bit of help sometimes because um this this is hard for some people to believe like if you don't have a mental illness and you never have sometimes you need medication <laughs> i have been on various medications and currently am on a uh, medication um so yeah i i want to give those disclaimers because sometimes i think like a book for addressed to people who have anxiety it's definitely not i don't want people to think like it's a cure for anxiety but it's something that is scripture has really helped me a lot um and helped me process through my anxiety and see and see like how i can be close to god despite and through my anxiety how it can be something that can help heal me and draw me close to God instead of make me feel shame or pull me away from God. And I really like that you were talking about uh, medications, because I think that's so taboo. Why are you on medication? But sometimes it's needed. And I went through a time in my life where I couldn't even focus. I was so messed up in therapy. Uh, so she put me on some medication and it just kind of slowed everything down and made everything clear. And my brain could process then as we went through the trauma therapy. And I think it's, you know, it's a little cliche, but people say diabetics need insulin. So why not the other organ in your brain that has a chemical imbalance and needs, you know, why, why, why isn't it okay? God is, has, uh, gifted very smart men and scientists to create these medications that are very, very helpful. And uh, so I am forever grateful for that. So I, I thank you because a lot of times, oh, just pray harder. And and how much, you know, I, I watch sometimes the videos when they had the camps down in Indiana and you see these young girls and they're talking about their quiet time and they're just struggling and hoping I came here because I don't feel close and I don't feel like I have the Holy Spirit and they're really, really struggling and all they're given is listen to more tapes or do this or do that rather than actual tangible help. So I really appreciate that. I am 100% on board with every bit of that. And um, I, I struggle a lot with the stigma of mental health treatment. I think that's awful. Um, we would not make someone feel bad about their heart medication. We wouldn't make them feel bad about the medication they need for their kidney or their liver or their lungs. Um, you know, people with asthma, we wouldn't make them feel bit bad about that. And I, we should be just as thankful and just as, um, we should, we should advocate for people to, who need medicine for their brain, um, to, to have it. I've even heard of people changing the name mental health to brain health because it's an organ. Your brain is an organ, just like your heart is an organ. Your liver is an organ. Your stomach is an organ. Your lungs are an organ. And so, um, we, we need to take care of that brain <laughs> for sure and get it med medication when it needs it. <laughs> I would say, I would add to that, not all medication is created equal and uh, n- not everybody is the same so what works for one person might not work for somebody else and i also think you shouldn't just have medication um i think medication uh alongside a therapy can be really helpful alongside building like other healthy rhythms is the the best approach but like you were saying, Emily, sometimes you just like you can't even do therapy because you are really mentally struggling <laughs> and you need you need those things hand in hand in order to just be able to function. Um, so, yeah, I'm right there with you all on that. I was diagnosed with postpartum anxiety after I had my first child. Um, but I was still in the message at the time. And I really didn't get the help that I needed at the time. Um, so it wasn't like a pray it away sort of situation. It was like a, 
oh, you're postpartum. This will, you'll get over this. Like it'll happen. Like enjoy your sweet baby. And meanwhile, I, I can't sleep. I went about 36, 48 hours after um, I first got home with my baby. I couldn't sleep. I was going insane. Um, <laughs> so don't, I would say get the help that you need so that you can be healthy for every aspect of your life. And what you need in this moment might not be what you need in the next moment. Like, uh, like Emily and Charity, both of you, you've had various needs um, in terms of medication and therapy throughout your journey out. And I think that's, that's normal. We, we all as people don't always have the same health problems that we, that we, uh, that we struggle with. And we are not always going to have the same mental health struggles. So if there's something new that's happening, it's okay to say, you know, I need to get some help with this new thing I'm experiencing. Um, I might have been out 15, 20 years, and all of a sudden, it's it's overwhelming for me, and I need help. It's okay, even that far out, to step back and say, you know what, I need to address this as a new problem. Um, I know that I dealt with it for this long, um, and I've, I've been in survival mode, and I've been able to work through it. But nobody needs to do that. There, there's no competition on who can go the longest without getting the heart medication that they need, right? There's no pressure. There's no shame in getting the help you need for mental health. I totally agree with that, Christy. I'm sorry that that was your experience. I can't imagine um, going through postpartum anxiety with without supportive people or like we being able to go to like therapy being in that environment where it's such a taboo and where it is kind of like a maybe pray it away maybe just wait for it to pass um i think it's good that we can talk about it and share because a lot, everyone's going through something uh, not all at once but everyone's going gonna go through something and struggle with their mental health probably at some point um and I think we should normalize that. And really, like, if you look at scripture, like, we live in a fallen world. It's post fall. Like, our bodies break down and sometimes our brains have some trouble too. <laughs> and our emotions have some troubles too sometimes. And, um, I think it can be honestly sinful if you're so prideful that you're like, I'm not going to do anything about this. I'm just going to try to like pray it away. I'm just going to do this. I'm not going to ask for help. Um, because like everybody needs help sometimes. Everybody needs help sometimes. Yeah. There's a lot of shame that goes into that discussion when you're, when you start talking about, um, people not wanting to get the help. I know that there is some pride that like, there's definitely that. Um, but for us, I don't know if this is true for the rest of you, but there is a lot of shame. Um, if I'm doing the right thing and I'm leaving this high control group and I'm in the right here, I'm doing what God's calling me to do. I'm doing what, you know, I'm leaving something that's wrong. Shouldn't I be okay? Like, shouldn't it, mm -hmm. shouldn't I just come out the other side and not have a struggle like this with my mental health? Um, I think that that's kind of the fallacy that gets you, um, because this isn't a problem that's isolated to high control groups. This is a problem that is universally felt by humanity. Um, like Charity said, it's documented in the Bible. There were mental health struggles for some of our, you know, most favorite Bible characters. They wrestled with it, talked about it. Um, there's, there's a long history of mental health struggles in humanity, um, especially in women. And we tend to not get the help that we need out of this sense that, well, if, uh, if they can get through it, if my grandmother could get through this without help, then I should be able to as well. But I don't think that that is necessary. It's not a competition yeah, but, to see you can suffer. <laughs> but why? 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 <laughs> like, it's like, uh, oh, yeah, like, um, maybe this is controversial. But like with, uh, you know, women have been having babies forever. Like, why do you need pain medication? Why do you need like, <laughs> medical right. intervention? Yeah. Um, <laughs> women were also dying in childbirth, like forever. So <laughs> like, I don't know, like, don't necessarily just take the past as like, automatically better. 
<laughs> um, yeah. I'm for one thankful for uh, like I got an epidural with my baby girl and I was very thankful for for having some pain medication. <laughs> I don't think we need to tough it out all the time. Well, that's a good one. Tough it out all the time. I think I think a lot of people in a lot of high control groups and even some who aren't are trying to tough it out all the time. <laughs> so um, this has been a fantastic conversation. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our time. So I'm going to give each of you a chance to leave us with any thoughts that you might have. And at the very end, I'm going to give Emily a chance to answer the question from our listener. Um, so who has some words they would like to leave the audience with before we sign off? I think a very good thing, uh, Henry Cloud, I believe he's the one who actually wrote the book on boundaries or one of the books on boundaries and talking about healthy and unhealthy boundaries and, you know, even uh, setting boundaries with people around us who were never in a high demand group. You know, it's just part of our daily life, but we also need to be careful. And I appreciate this quote from him it says, if you've ever been on the receiving end of someone claiming to set boundaries and then cutting you off without giving you a chance to reconcile, know that is not what boundaries are truly about. And if you're the one doing this, it's essential to understand that this approach does not serve you or your relationships. By avoiding conflict and not building the necessary skills to set boundaries within relationships, you'll be ill-equipped for future relationships. And I think that is very good and a very good warning, as unfortunately we do see people leaving high-demand groups ill-equipped and sometimes crashing and burning. And I think that's one of the reasons we're here putting our voice out um, around the world is because we do want people equipped and healthy. And to know today we're talking about mental health and healthy boundaries. I think that's kind of my takeaway is lean into it. You're going to be better off for it. I would definitely agree with that. I recently did a YouTube video on boundaries from a biblical perspective. Um, so if anyone's interested, shameless plug, go jump over there and check that out. Um, but I mentioned on there, like, some of those, like, you have to have conflict with people. Some of my closest friends, like, I've had some really hard conflict with. And we've worked through it. You know, like there were boundaries there. They were crossed. You know, we got to talk through it. We need to apologize. Um have that humility. Um, one other thing that I did want to share, because we're using all these terms like boundaries and mental health, and those like terms might be overwhelming for somebody coming out of the message. And um, like those things, I would say they, they've always existed. I don't know if this is going to make sense, but they've always existed. It's just like the Bible might not use that term, might not say like, this is how you set up a boundary with somebody. Um, this is, this person struggled with mental health. This person, like, David has anxiety. <laughs> like, it's not gonna, like, say it like that, but there's still, like, it still existed. And we can still learn from, from scripture and, and from each other throughout time. It's not, like, I don't know, sometimes people think it's like, oh, a newfangled thing. It's just new terms for things that have always, like, been around. Really enjoyed this discussion. I think that, um, having a way to set healthy boundaries is going to be um, like having having a mechanism and having the uh, the self-confidence to set healthy boundaries for people that leave a high control group is going to be a new experience and it's going to feel uncomfortable um, for me when I when I was in the high control group um, I wasn't establishing boundaries with people outside um, I had I had some family that was crossing reasonable boundaries um, even when I was inside this high control group. The problem was that I was ill-equipped to set the line and say like this is what is unacceptable um, for my safety, for my um, personal well-being and um, I wasn't setting those boundaries. Leaving a high control group it feels disrespectful sometimes to set a boundary. Um, we're taught to be always respectful, especially of our elders, of our parents. Um, it can feel sometimes like um, you're being uh, confrontational 
or that you're being difficult. <laughs> um, and I think that those words uh, that are there and like floating in your head and like saying in the back of your mind, like, this isn't right, you shouldn't be doing this. Um, that's something that's going to be an ongoing struggle um, for people that leave a high control group to have that, that idea that I'm doing something wrong by setting this boundary. I would honestly recommend um, the book Emily suggested. There's another book. Um, it's just called Boundaries. <laughs> um, I can't remember what the author's name is. Um, that book was really helpful for me in order to sort of understand what, what I should be setting um, and how to set those boundaries. I think one of the most important things that we can do for people um, is to uh, give them the means to make amends um, and tell them how that's going to look. Like if, if you cross my line, here's the consequence, but here's how we get back. Um, and giving an avenue for people to reconcile with you. Um, now whether or not they go that route is, is entirely out of your control. Um, and then I would say continuously setting that line and saying this is where it is, this is where it's going to remain. Um, as time goes on, you might find that there are things in your life that need boundaries that you didn't think possibly did. Um, a good example of this is with your time. So that was something that I have had to set a boundary with in the last couple of years with people is, you know, I can't be on the phone and discuss something with you for hours and hours and hours on end. We have to have a line here. And that seems like a pretty trivial one. It's fairly easy to set that boundary. Like, listen, you can't call me at six o'clock and expect me to be on the phone for an hour. Like, I'm going to have to get off. Um, but even that, that kind of thing is a boundary that we set with people. Um, and all of that is healthy. All of that is normal. All of that is a universal human experience. It's going to be harder if you've left a high control group as a woman, especially. Um, but it can be done. <laughs> uh, get out there. Figure out what um, resources are available. We'll have some in the comments below the video. Um, some links to books, to charities uh, video, so that you can um, sort, start sorting through that, figure out what's comfortable for you, and making those choices for yourself on what healthy boundaries look like for you. Absolutely. Very wise words. Charity, thank you so much for being part of our show. And um, feel free to give us any last words that you have, and then we're going to be true to our word and answer the question that a listener sent in. Like I said at the beginning, I'm honored to be on the show. Um, I really appreciate it. I guess I would just say like to anybody who is leaving a high control group, like the message or the message, um, give yourself grace, give yourself time. You're figuring stuff out and you're definitely not going to do it perfectly. <laughs> um, we've said that kind of a few times in various ways, but, um, you're going to need time. You're going to need time to process. You're going to need time to figure out how to do things. You don't have to have all your beliefs set in stone. You'll probably be getting a lot of questions like right when you leave. Oh, okay. Like, what do you believe now then? Like, oh, um, well, um, are you going to be wearing pants? You know, like you're going to have a lot of those questions coming at you and it's okay to say, I don't know. I'm figuring it out. <laughs> Because And just have grace with yourself. Like You don't have to figure it out all at once if you're leaving that group. You can just take that, that one first step. Absolutely. Thank you again so much. And um, Emily, why don't you take it away with answering the question a listener sent in. All right. Yes. Uh, thank you. And we thank all of our listeners that are there sharing, talking, interacting. And uh, if you email us, we do respond. And we're happy to have questions because obviously we're here as a voice and uh, we're happy to be your voice as well. We will respect your privacy and uh, we know it's sensitive leaving a high control group and uh 
you might have questions and we haven't addressed them or even thought about addressing them. So the question is, after I left the message, some of the doctrine is still with me 25 years later. The hell, fire and brimstone, the fear, the constant shame embedding itself in me. Textbook spiritual abuse. I have a specific question that always comes up. Blasphemy. Saying something that is not of the Holy Spirit when it is. The unforgivable sin per the Bible. This is one verse that has continually plagued me. Can you please offer insight? And when we are talking amongst ourselves, um, I think this is just one symptom of a greater whole within these high control groups being that fear aspect and using fear to control. Um, so within the group, what do they say exactly? Uh, here's a quote from... Uh, Branham, which says, what did Jesus say? You say about me, I'll forgive you. But when the Holy Ghost is to come and does the same thing, speak one word against it and it'll never be forgiven to you in this world, neither in the world to come. End quote. Because they called the Spirit of God an unclean spirit. How many have ever known that blaspheming the Holy Ghost to call the very works of God the devil? That is why Jesus said it. That's blasphemy unpardonable, can never be forgiven for doing it. There is zero grace in that, and that God is a jerk. That's all I have to say about that. So what did Jesus actually say in Matthew twelve thirty one? So I tell you, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which can never be forgiven. So what is the context of that? Um, blasphemy is defiant irreverence. And uh, so in that context that they were talking, uh, they were accusing Jesus of being demon possessed. And this particularly blasphemy cannot be duplicated today because Jesus is not here on earth. Uh, and no one's watching him do these miracles and can accuse him of that. Today, the unpardonable sin is a state of unbelief, which makes sense. If you're not believing, you're not going to be forgiven your sins. So God offers grace and forgiveness for all. Um, so us as Christians, um, those of us who are Christians, we believe um, if you ask for forgiveness, God will forgive you. So that fear is uh, is broken and doesn't have to control us. And we want to talk about that fear and many other fears that are used for control in these aptly named high control groups because it is used as a destructive tool. Even going so far as to say, if you doubt one word that the powerful leader who is supposed to know all and speak on God's behalf says, then you're committing the unpardonable sin. You know, so that's insinuated. It's not just the Holy Spirit, but don't speak ill against the group as a whole or the leader. And uh, that is something that is a, a fear tactic that's used. So I think that's a very good question. I think that's something a lot of people struggle with. And uh, I would say... Don't take anyone's word for these things. Go out, search it yourself. There's some great resources out there. Um, the one that I like and that I recommended to the listener is gotquestions.org. Um, but again, use your discernment. Read the Bible if that's the direction you're going. As a Christian, speak to friends that are trusted. Uh, ask questions. It is okay to ask questions. Um, that's a whole other topic for another time as well. There was also a statement William Branham made when someone was afraid they had committed the unpardonable sin. He said, as long as you are wanting to repent, you have a desire to repent and you're coming to God for forgiveness, you will receive that forgiveness. Now, obviously, William Branham talked out of both sides of his mouth a lot. So in this <laughs> instance, he was answering a question with compassion. Um, but I would say he's exactly right about that. Anyone who comes to God with repentance and wants to be forgiven, God will forgive them. That's biblical. So and I love that, Emily. I thought you handled that question well. Um, people have accused me of like blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, just saying that Brandomism is a cult. And I'm like... I just, it's just, that's not what the Bible's talking about when it's saying blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. It's not saying blaspheming against 
Branham? Like, what are you saying? Like, by saying that I'm <laughs> blaspheming by saying this about Branham. It doesn't, <laughs> it's not actually biblical, but I think people have these ideas that are so intertwined. And I get that from the, the writer. It's clearly, like, some of these things have lingered. <laughs> and so, you don't be afraid to like go back and look at the look at the Bible, look online, see see what it's actually about to try to untangle some of that. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Charity, for being our guest. We hope everyone found the show informative and helpful. Feel free to contact us at our parent company, freeandclearshow.com with any questions or ideas for future shows. I look forward to hearing from you as we continue to demonstrate that life goes on and healing happens as long as you keep moving forward.